Ezekiel chapter 7. We're going to look at chapter 7 here in the book of Ezekiel. And uh, I have to, uh, you know, I have to begin by telling you that the, the title of the message is The End Has Come. Does that tell you what this chapter is about? You know, so let's get ready to dive on in. But it's a, a chapter that relates to judgment God is bringing on the nation of Israel. Ezekiel chapter 7, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 4. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, And you, son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, an end. The end has come upon the four corners of the land. Now the end has come upon you, and I will send my anger against you. I will judge you according to your ways, and I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare you nor will I have pity, but I will repay your ways and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, notice with me as we begin in verse 1 here in chapter 7, just a couple of introductory remarks and all. Notice with me how he says, the word of the Lord came to me. If you take notes, you might want to note this. I found this interesting even as I was preparing this study. The phrase, the word of the Lord came to me, is the most common phrase that Ezekiel uses. He uses it 46 times in this book. 46 times Ezekiel says, the word of the Lord came to me. And the point he's making and that which he is emphasizing is, is that he wasn't seeking this message. The word of the Lord came to him. He wasn't seeking this message but was given the message to proclaim to them. It's a message God gave to him. The word of the Lord came to me. It isn't something that he created. You see, God is revealing himself to the people, and he's doing so through the prophet Ezekiel. As I've mentioned before, in the Old Testament, if you take notes, Deuteronomy chapter 29, verse 29, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may follow all the words of this law. There are things that are secret and there are things that are revealed. That's one of the reasons why the occult is so wrong, is so sinful, because the word occult speaks of the hidden things. And those who are involved in the occult are those who are involved in trying to discern or to come up with uh, what is hidden. And God has stated there are secret things, things that I have chosen not to reveal to you. But there are other things that I have chosen to reveal to you, and those things belong to you, and they belong to your children also. And so this is what he is doing. The word of the Lord has come to him and he's revealing the message that God gave to him. Now, now who'd really want to give that kind of message? It's a message of judgment. It would be a message difficult to deliver. But it's the message that God has given to him to deliver. And there's a reason why God had said in Ezekiel in chapter 2 verse 4 concerning them, they are impudent and stubborn children. He said, I'm sending you to them and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. They are impudent and they are stubborn children, and I am sending you to them with a message. And so this message that God gave is a message of judgment. And it's a phrase that communicates also, because the word of the Lord came to me, it's a phrase that also communicates that Ezekiel isn't making up what he is saying. He's not a false teacher. He's not a false prophet. He's a true prophet. And he's giving a genuine message from God. Again, false prophets communicate what's in their own hearts. They want to say things, smooth things, deceitful things, things that people want to hear, things that will tickle their ears. They want to say things that people are asking to hear in order that they might be able to retain them for their donations and for the ego boost and everything else that they get from having followers. Now, Ezekiel wasn't that way. Ezekiel is speaking a true message where false prophets are simply trying to develop people who are following after them. Jeremiah 23, 26 asks the question, how long will this be in the heart of the prophets who prophesy lies? Indeed, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. So there are those who go forth bringing forth those things that are really finding their origin in their own imagination, in their own fallen nature. That's what false prophets do, but not a true prophet. And God is saying that I am giving you this message so that the people will know beyond a shadow of a doubt 
that God is the Lord. That's what he says in verse 4. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. And so this message has been given so that they might know that it's God and who God is. It's interesting, that phrase, you shall know that I am the Lord, is used three times in this book. It, it's used in this passage. It's used in chapter 13, verse 9, and again in chapter 23, verse 49. And all that they're going to go through is intended to awaken them just to know who God is. And so that's what we see. And as we begin chapter 7, chapter 7 contains the second message of judgment against the land of Israel. You see, up until chapter 5, Ezekiel's message has been concerning the city of Jerusalem. But when we got into chapter 6, he had a message for Israel, and that message is a continuation here in chapter 7. This is the second message that he has against the land. Now, we know that Babylon, the nation of Babylon, devastated the nation of Israel. The nation of Babylon had two military campaigns against the nation of Israel. They had come from the north, and they had, had uh, brought them under, under attack and, and had, had, had uh, destroyed them. And, and they had come in 605 B.C., and a second time they had come in in 597 B.C., and so what we have here is, is a prophecy that really relates to their third campaign that's going to start in 588. Now, on both of those occasions, inhabitants, as we have seen already, had been left behind in the, um, in the city of Jerusalem and left behind in Judah. But in spite of such harsh judgment and in spite of all that they've gone through, they haven't turned to God. They haven't seen God's hand in any of this, and, and they've remained rebellious. And so he is speaking to them, and he's saying to them in verse 2, You son of man, thus says the Lord God to the land of Israel, an end. The end has come upon the four corners of the land. My patience, he's saying, has come to an end. And what is going to happen is you will have a final destruction. And now there are those who would say, Why destruction? It seems so wrong. It seems so unlike a God of love to do such a thing. One of the things we need to remember as we study the book of Ezekiel is that they had many opportunities. As a matter of fact, the nation of Israel had centuries of opportunities. And yet, in its entire history, you see a continuation of one thing. They continually turn to idols. You see that through their entire history, they keep rejecting God and returning to idols. And so, the judgment God is bringing here isn't rising from a lack of love for the people. The judgment that God is bringing against him arises because of his holiness, because they have rejected him, and he's a holy God. In Psalm 5, verse 4, the Scripture says, You are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness, nor shall evil dwell with you. In the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk, in chapter 1, verse 13, the prophet writes, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look on wickedness. So God is judging them because of their constant returning to the sin of idolatry. Idolatry is an ingrained habit in the nation of Israel. It's a habit that they practiced over the centuries. You can see God speaking against this in, in the book of Judges, in chapter 10, for example, verse 6, where it says, The children of Israel again did evil in the sight of the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreths, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the people of Ammon, the gods of the Philistines, and they forsook the Lord and did not serve Him. It was a constant, constant thing that God had to deal with. In chapter 5 here, in Ezekiel, verse 11, Therefore, as I live, says the Lord God, surely because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable things and with all your abominations, therefore I will also diminish you. My eye will not spare, nor will I have any pity. So God has been speaking to them and warning them. In chapter 6, verse 6, he said, in all your dwelling places, the city shall be laid waste. The high places shall be desolate, so that your altars may be laid waste and made desolate. Your idols may be broken, made to cease. Your incense altars may be cut down. Your works may be abolished. In verse 9, 
Then those of you who escape will remember me among the nations where they're carried captive because I was crushed by their adulterous heart which has departed from me and by their eyes which play the harlot after their idols. They will loathe themselves for the evils which they committed in all their abominations. In the Old Testament, God is declared to be the husband of the nation of Israel. In the New Testament, Jesus is described as the husband and the church is the bride of Christ. So in the Old Testament, God will speak to them as if they are adulterous, an adulterous wife. And that's why he says, you've crushed my heart. Because in your idolatry, you have forsaken me and you've clung to another lover. And as a result of that, I will bring judgment. And the judgment is not just a localized judgment in the city of Jerusalem. I will bring judgment upon the whole land. When he says in verse 3, the end has come upon you, I will send my anger against you, I will judge you according to your ways, I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare you, nor will I have pity. I will repay your ways, and your abominations will be in your midst. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. He's basically simply saying, I've given you opportunities to repent, and you've rejected those opportunities. God didn't, in other words, didn't bring judgment. And you know that. God doesn't bring judgment immediately. He actually gives us space to repent. In 2 Peter 3.15, uh, the apostle Peter said, Consider that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation. God doesn't move immediately. He gives you opportunity to repent. He actually does something to bring you into a place of, of mercy. I, I believe that with all of my heart. I've seen that in practical application. He doesn't move immediately. He gives you opportunity. Here's a Josiah illustration. My grandson yesterday, I hope you don't mind this if you do too bad. My grandson. My, my, my daughter Corinne was not feeling well. And so... Yesterday, my grandson was supposed to go on a field trip. But because Corinne wasn't feeling well, Marie and I went to the house in order that Marie might be able to go with Josiah on this field trip. Corinne, my daughter, has the flu. And so, to relieve Corinne of that duty, and it's the joy of Marie's heart, Marie was going to go with Josiah. But Josiah didn't want to go to school yesterday. He's like his grandfather. He didn't want to go to school, you know. And so, he's, you know, when we got there early in the morning, he, he has his, he takes his pajama tops off and he's just kind of sitting in his room and, and I know my grandson, so he's going, oh, my stomach's hurting. And so I go walking in there and he's just kind of standing there. This, he's only five years old and I've got this heart for him, you know, and I'm looking at him and, and, I, and I walk in, I say, what's wrong? He says, oh, my stomach is aching so bad. And I said, is that right? And so I take him and I wrap my arms around him and I hold him in my arms and I begin to talk to him and I begin to say to him things like, well, you know, do you, do you not want to go? I mean, what is this? Well, you know, Papa, I just don't feel well. And, and I know that that's not the absolute 100% truth. You know, there are things going on inside of him right now that are making him not want to go. One of those major things is mama's not going to be able to go and I want my mom with me. And so, you know, I prevail on mom and grandma takes him off for the day and enjoys company with him and he doesn't go on the field trip. He spends time with grandma. Well, today I'm talking to my daughter and she had said, well, you know, he's just not telling the truth. You know, that's not the truth. And I'm smiling at the girl who lied to me for years, you know. <laughs> Come on, don't tell me anything about lying, girlfriend. <laughs> and I'm smiling at her, and I say, you know, baby girl, sometimes when children are five years of age, they don't know exactly how to express what's inside of their hearts. And so what may appear to be a fabrication, in reality, isn't a lie, and I'll tell you why it's not a lie. It requires a person to willingly desire to deceive in order to be a liar. And because even the rabbi stated that a person didn't come to a maturity until they were at least 12 years of age, knowing the good from the evil, the left hand from the right, 
rabbis themselves would claim that you didn't enter into adulthood until you were probably around 13 years of age. At that point, you could become bar mitzvah. You can become recognized as an adult within the nation of Israel. It's probable that, that kids five years of age don't really know what truth is. They don't at that point. Some politicians don't either, but we'll talk about that some other time. And so, Josiah is not telling you lies so much as saying what he considers convenient, but in reality is a way for him to get what he wants because he doesn't know how to express to you what he really feels. So give him a break is what I'm saying. Give him a break. He's a baby. He needs to learn some things. He just wants to be with you. Now, what's that all about? Is that just a, uh, is that a, a grandfather who is, is just doing everything he can to make sure he doesn't get a spanking? Absolutely, but beyond that. <laughs> that's a merciful heart because you don't want to. And like I've told my, my daughter before, don't spank him in front of me. I don't want to see that. That's the one thing I don't want you to do in front of me. I don't want him disciplined in front of me because I have a heart that loves that little boy with all that's in me. I really do. I love that little boy with all that's within me. And I think that that's the kind of heart, forgive me, that the Lord has for us. I do not believe that God wants to judge us. The long-suffering of God is, is, is salvation. He wants to give us opportunities to get right with him so he doesn't crack down on us the first time we blow it. He actually awakens us through his word and by his spirit to, to what truth is and what deceit is. And so God is not an angry God desiring to trash Israel. You need to know that as we study Ezekiel. God has been given this nation. He's been giving this nation centuries to repent and he would bring his judgment on them after giving them prophets and after giving them his word and, and saying to them, why will you not repent? Why will you perish? Why will you, why will you go that way? And as, as a God who loved the nation, it wasn't something that was pleasurable to him. We'll see that later on. God says it in the book of Ezekiel. He says, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked. God's desire isn't that people should perish, but that they should come to repentance and have a relationship with him. And so he has now gotten to the end of his patience with them, and he's saying, you're about to reap what you sow. And, and it's going to come to you. This judgment will come without pity because this punishment is going to fit the crime. You are going to be judged according to your ways. You are going to be repaid for your abominations. You see, you have had more opportunity to know my word than all the nations around you, God could say. You see, in the book of Romans, in chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, Paul says, what advantage then is there in being a Jew? Or what value is there in circumcision? Much in every way. First of all, they have been entrusted with the very words of God. And so the nation of Israel had the word of God where God declared his mind to them. Other nations didn't have that. The nation of Israel did. In chapter 9 of Romans, verses 4 and 5, he says, theirs is the adoption as sons. Theirs is the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship, the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs. From them is traced the human ancestry of Christ, who is God over all forever praised Amen. So you have great responsibility. Therefore, you are going to be dealt with according to the measure of understanding you have. And so God is saying, I'm going to bring this. I will repay you your ways. And you're going to know that I am the Lord. Verse 5, thus says the Lord God, a disaster, a singular disaster. Behold, it has come. An end has come. The end has come. It has dawned for you. Behold, it has come. Doom has come to you, you who dwell in the land. The time has come. A day of trouble is near, and not of rejoicing in the mountains. Now upon you I will soon pour out my fury and spend my anger upon you. I will judge you according to your ways 
and I will repay you for all your abominations. My eye will not spare, nor will I have pity. I will repay you according to your ways, and your abominations will be in your midst. And then you shall know that I am the Lord who strikes. So Ezekiel portrays the coming judgment as if, as if they've been asleep. And, and or the judgment has been asleep, and now it has awakened. And when it awakens, it, it leaps upon the ones who awakened it. He's saying, your time of sin has run its course and judgment alone remains for you. In verses 7 and 8, he says, doom has come to you, you who dwell in the land. In other words, it's not a time of rejoicing, it's a time of calamity. Now, basically what he's doing is he repeats himself because they're not listening. Messages of concern can fall on deaf ears. You can say something over and over again and people choose not to listen or are so caught up with whatever it is that they're doing that that they're not even paying any attention to you as you cry out to them. Remember a few years ago, guys, do you remember when that tsunami hit the southeast, Southeast Asia? When we were here in church, I showed a video that I still remember, a video that was, was um, taken by a man who was, was off the shoreline in a hotel area in an upper floor. And as he was videoing this this wave that was out in the distance. What happens with the tsunami is, as he was taking this picture, you can see this, is the water recedes. And when the water recedes, because the wave is so immense, it, it can recede from the shoreline there. And if you're not aware that it's, it's a tsunami condition, then you can be taken. And what happened is this man is, uh, is on top of this building with his camera, and he zooms in on a man who's there in the, where the water has receded. He's walked out there dangerously far, and the man is picking up fish, and he's putting it in a basket because he sees this, this receding of the water as really being for him a blessing. And there he is. He's picking up these fish, and, and some of you might have been with us when I showed that video, and, and, and then you start hearing the man who's taking the, 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 making the video, you can hear him as he's yelling to this man, come back, come back, and you hear him screaming, and, and in the distance you see the camera as it lifts, and you can see the wave it's coming, and those waves come in several hundred miles an hour, and, and it's coming in with the force of a thousand Mack trucks. And this man who's out there gathering fish is paying no attention to the man who's up there on top of that roof, crying out for him, get to safety, run for your life. And we see in this video the wave as it comes churning, and it's like a blender. There is so much debris in the water. Anything that is caught by that wave is instantly blended and it just destroyed instantly and we see that as a wave rushes upon the guy in the midst of this other man crying out saying save yourself come back save yourself he was so caught up getting fish that he lost his life for something he thought was a blessing and today the church is the same way the same way not just the nation but even the church gets caught up with the now, with the moment, with what makes me happy, what gives me pleasure. And you have this book here crying out saying, you're going to reap what you're sowing. You're going to be dealt with. You're not going to get away with it. And yet the nation of Israel, not paying attention whatsoever to the fact that God is going to deal with them. He said in verse 9, my eye will not spare nor will I have pity, I will repay you according to your ways. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7 in the New Testament says, Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Verse 10, Behold the day. Behold, it has come. Doom has gone out. The rod has blossomed. Pride has budded. Violence has risen up into a rod of wickedness. None of them shall remain, none, none of their multitude, none of them, nor shall there be wailing for them. The time has come 
The day draws near. Let not the buyer rejoice, nor the seller mourn, for wrath is on their whole multitude. For the seller shall not return to what has been sold, though he may still be alive. For the vision concerns the whole multitude, and it shall not turn back. No one will strengthen himself who lives in iniquity. They have blown the trumpet and made everyone ready, but no one goes to battle. For my wrath is on all their multitude. The sword is outside, and the pestilence and famine within. Whoever is in the field will die by the sword. Whoever is in the city, famine and pestilence will devour him. Those who survive will escape and be on the mountains like doves of the valley, all of them mourning each for his iniquity. He speaks of the rod that buds. When he says the rod is budded, that speaks of Babylon. It's the nation that God is going to use to chastise Israel. And he's saying judgment has come because Israel's sin is begging for a response from God. In verse 11, he says, violence has risen up into a rod of wickedness. In this verse, the rod mentioned refers to the evil of the nation. It's a nation steeped in wickedness. And he's simply saying, you're not going to make it through the judgment unscathed. Now, there'll be a small amount that will make it through, but not all of you. In the book of Lamentations, in chapter 3, verse 22, Jeremiah said, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. So God is saying, I'm bringing judgment, and there will be a remnant. There will be some who remain, but the majority of you will not. Notice verse 13. No one will strengthen himself who lives in iniquity. Living in sin doesn't strengthen you. Living in sin destroys you. Living in sin weakens you. Why is that? Well, because sin always tears down. Sin never builds up. And the result of living in sin will always be chastising or judgment from God. And so no one will strengthen himself who lives in iniquity. There are people who lie to themselves all the time, who think they're going to get away with it just because the Lord didn't move on you quickly, just because you didn't get caught the first time you stole or didn't get caught the first time you cheated on your wife or your husband. You didn't get caught, and therefore you think you're not going to get caught. You think you're going to get away with it. And the fact is, no, God has given you opportunity to repent, but ultimately you will be dealt with. And, and you never are going to become better because of sin. Sin will always destroy you. Sin always brings you down. It never builds you up. It never makes you better. Sin never does. It always destroys. And it always results in judgment from God. Now, in verses 14 through 16, they've blown the trumpet made everyone ready. No one goes to battle. In other words, sin has eaten away the heart of the people to the point that it's even destroying your military. Safety will be found nowhere. The sword will cut down everybody inside and outside of the cities. Disease and famine are going to decimate the land as God brings judgment through Babylon. Again, in Lamentations 1, 18 through 20, it says, The Lord is righteous, for I rebelled against His commandment. Hear now, all the people, behold my sorrow. My virgins and my young men have gone into captivity. I called for my lovers, but they deceived me. My priests and my elders breathed their last in the city while they sought food to restore their life. See, O Lord, that I am in distress. My soul is troubled. My heart is overturned within me, for I have been very rebellious. Outside the sword bereaves at home, it is like death. And so it's a picture of what happened to the city of Jerusalem. That's what Lamentations is speaking about there when the decimation came through the nation of Babylon. Verse 17, every hand will be feeble. Every knee will be as weak as water. They will also be girded with sackcloth. Horror will cover them. Shame will be on every face. Baldness on all their heads. They will throw their silver into the streets. Their gold will be like refuse. Their silver and their gold will not be able to deliver them in the day of wrath of the Lord. They will not satisfy their souls nor fill their stomachs because it became their stumbling block of iniquity. This is taking place within the walls of the city of Jerusalem. There's loss of strength, there's shame, there's horror, and there's mourning everywhere. Interestingly, in verse 19, when it says they will throw their silver into the streets, 
Their gold will be like refuse. That's interesting because if you read that, the word refuse, we know it as being trash. But when you look at it and you look at the Hebrew word and you look at the context and its connotation, that's a word that is actually used in reference to sexual impurity. And what he's, what he's talking about is a sexual impurity that is associated with idolatry. It's a picture of somebody who has given themselves over to a false lover and has become unclean because of it. And what you have here is weakness and you have despair, you have grief, and you have mourning that is associated with it. Their sins have driven them from the peace of their homes. Their sins have driven them into the wilderness of the mountains. They're like tame doves amongst the wild. They mourn over what has been happening to them. He speaks concerning baldness, which I found interesting in verse 18, baldness on all their heads. This is a picture of them shaving their hair so that they have no hair any longer. And it's a picture of humiliation and sorrow. In the Old Testament book of Micah, chapter 1, verse 16, it says, make yourself bald and cut off your hair because of your precious children. Enlarge your baldness like an eagle. They shall go from you into captivity. It's a picture of humiliation. And he's saying that you have gone through humiliation. Now, you have all of this money, you have all this gold, and you have all this silver, but it's worthless. It's worthless to you. Your, rich, your riches aren't going to profit you. They can't save you. In, in Proverbs 11:4, it says, Riches do not profit in the day of wrath. Righteousness delivers from death. Psalm 49, 6 through 8 says, Those who trust in their wealth and boast in the multitude of their riches, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give God a ransom for him. The redemption of their souls is costly, and it shall cease forever. See, the bottom line is, is money isn't going to save you. Money can't save you. Money isn't going to bring you anything that you really want. And the point he's saying is you can't be saved by it. You have so much of it, but what were you using your gold and your silver for? What you were using it for is to plate your idols. You were taking your gold and you are taking your silver, and you were using it as plating for your idols, and so it's going to do you no good. It's unclean to me. I don't accept it. And it can't purchase you. It, it doesn't buy you. You know, that's the one thing that we need to understand today is that a lot of times we think that our finances are going to make us secure, and obviously our finances don't. It wasn't that long ago when people's houses were going through the roof in terms of their value and the prices that they had. There was a house down the street uh, one of my kids was looking at for a little while. And uh, so I went with them to go look at it to see whether or not they, they'd be able to qualify to buy it. And, and uh, the house uh, had been sold for about $350,000 to somebody. Actually, the house was going for about that much and they couldn't qualify for that. And, um, and it was sold. And then I, I drove by because what happened is somebody had, had purchased it with the, with the idea to turn it around and make a profit, like a lot of people were trying to do. But the bubble had burst. And they were asking something like, and I wish I could give you an exact number, it was something like $460,000 or so. So they were trying to make a $100,000 profit within the course of like, two months after purchasing it, the bubble had burst. And so it was up for sale for over a year. And I went there, just drove by just to see what they were asking for it. And they were actually asking for almost, uh, almost what it was originally worth. It was worth, when it was sold, it was going, the actual money that was owed was like $260,000. The original guy who sold it made a $100,000 profit. This guy tried to, who purchased it tried to make that, and he ended up losing a considerable amount of money because the bubble burst. And there are so many Americans, as we know, that have experienced that, who purchased homes and, and trusted, really, to be honest with you, trusted in, in their gold and trusted in their silver. And as a result of that, made some poor choices in a bad time and ended up saying, man, I wish I didn't do that. I wish I hadn't spent that money. I wish I hadn't have made that mistake. As innocent as many were, by the way, as innocent in that as they were, they were simply trying to buy a house. But many people were taken advantage of in many ways, and others made some pretty poor choices. What we have learned, and this nation is learning right now, money can't save you. Money can't save you. And some people are, are, are alerting to that now. And in this difficult time, 
It's a, it's a hard lesson to learn. Money can't save you. And your money, you can't trust it because you might have something that's worth something right now to somebody that loses its value almost overnight. And God is saying, listen, you have your gold and you have your silver. You trusted in that so much so you even plated your idols with it. Try and use that money now to save yourself. You can't. Notice verse 20. As for the beauty of his ornaments, he set it in majesty, but they made from it the images of their abominations, their detestable things. Therefore I have made it like refuse to them. I will give it as plunder into the hands of strangers and as the wicked of the earth and to the wicked of the earth as spoil, and they shall defile it. I'll turn my face from them. They will defile my secret place, for robbers shall enter it and defile it. Make a chain, for the land is filled with crimes of blood, and the city is full of violence. Therefore I will bring the worst of the Gentiles, and they will possess their houses. I will cause the pomp of the strong to cease, and their holy places shall be defiled. Destruction comes. They will seek peace, but there shall be none. Disaster will come upon disaster, and rumor will be upon rumor. And then they will seek a vision from a prophet, but the law will perish from the priest and counsel from the elders. The king will mourn. The prince will be clothed with desolation, and the hands of the common people will tremble. I will do to them according to their way, and according to what they deserve, I will judge them. Then they shall know that I am the Lord." And so when he says in verse 20, the beauty of his ornaments, he said it in majesty. Well, this speaks of the temple. The temple is a place intended to bring glory to God. It's a place that was polluted by their abominations. As a matter of fact, when we get into chapter 8, we're going to see that clearly. You see, when Babylon entered the temple, they plundered it. You see that in 2 Kings 24. So he goes on and says, make a chain, in verse 23, for the land is filled with crimes. The chain is a symbol of captivity that's awaiting them. They forged this chain by their own sins and deserved the punishment they were receiving. Sin brings bondage. And he's saying, you forged your own chain of slavery. There's a movie that's on every Christmas, A Christmas Carol, and in it you have one of the, uh, one of the characters that is rattling a chain. And uh, if you've ever seen that, I'm, I'm guessing most every American has seen that movie a thousand times. It's on every Christmas several times. But when you see it, he says, this is the chain that I forged when I was on earth. That's a picture that you have in Ezekiel. He's saying that your sins have made you a slave. Your sins have brought you into bondage. There are people who claim that they're not in bondage to sin. I talk to people who will say that. I'm not in bondage at all, you know. But, but that's, you know, that's just absolutely not true. There's too many people when they have a sober moment will admit that they're in bondage. Talk to somebody who's an alcoholic. And, and when they're drinking, they won't tell you that they're in bondage. They'll, they'll say, no, I enjoy it. I can stop whenever I want. Talk to somebody who's addicted to nicotine. They'll tell you they can stop smoking anytime they want. They're in bondage to it. They just don't admit it. And it's a chain that they forge for themselves. And when you get into a sin life, when you're into sin, what happens is you're actually enslaved by it. You become a creature of it. It's something that is holding you fast. It's a chain that you wear. And it's a chain that, you, that, that is actually holding you as a prisoner. Jesus said in John 8, 34, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And that's absolutely true. There have been times when I've talked to people who have alcohol problems who will say to me, I am a slave. I need to be set free. Talk to somebody. I've talked to people who have been uh, addicted to drugs and everything. And they'll, they, in the sober moment, they'll say, I am sick of this. I am tired of this. I've talked to people who have uh, pornography problems and, and in, their, in their more sober moment, they'll say, I can't stand this anymore. I hate what I do, but I find myself going back to it. It's a slavery. It's, it's, it's bondage. It's, it's what's holding them fast, and you can see it. 
Talk to somebody who's got a, a temper problem and, and they'll tell you after they've been cruel to somebody or been vicious to somebody and, and they have a sober moment, they'll say, I hate what I do. I'm in bondage to it. That's what sin is. It's bondage. 2 Peter 2.19 says, By whom a person is overcome by him also he's brought into bondage. And that's what sin is. It keeps you in bondage. And that's why Jesus Christ is the bondage breaker. Jesus Christ comes to set the captives free. And that's what he does. That's what the power of the gospel is all about. I didn't take one of those 12-step programs. I was a, a, a kid who liked to drink. I drank for years, and I, and I overdrank constantly. As I've said to you before, for me when I was about 19, my Friday night started with a half gallon of wine and a quart of beer. That's how it started. And, and I, I drank like that all the time. And, and, and I, I got to the point where I could, I could drink an awful lot without getting drunk. And, and, and I was already a confirmed alcoholic by the time I was 19. By the time I was 20, it was a habit of my life. And it was bondage. And it was bondage. But Jesus Christ came into my life. I didn't go to a 12-step program. I took one step. I came to Christ, and he set me free. He changed my life. He gave me the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. I know that Jesus Christ can set the captive free. I have no doubt about that at all. See, I didn't become religious. I never was wanting to be religious. I came to a relationship with the living God. When we celebrate Easter, we celebrate the reality of the fact that the Savior that we have, who we have as our Savior, is alive. That's why we speak of Him as if He's actually in the room. That's why we speak of Him as if He actually exists. It's because we have a relationship with a living Savior, God who, who actually moves in our life. We don't have dead idols, and we're not any longer in bondage to sin because my bondage breaker, my Savior, Jesus Christ, gave me in the power of the Spirit the ability to live for Him and to be free from the addictions that at one time controlled my life. But this nation here has a chain that they have forged. And God says, this is a chain, chain that you've made for yourself. You're going to try and, and, and forge peace treaties with those that are coming against you, he says in verse 25. But that won't save you. They're going to be wave after wave after wave of, of, of trouble that you're going to deal with. Disaster and rumor is something that you will deal with. And what are you going to do? You're going to get religious. Notice verse 26. You're going to seek a vision from a prophet but the law is going to perish from the priest. You're going to go to your spiritual leaders for direction, but God is saying, I will not give them revelation. Nearly two centuries earlier, God had made it clear this would take place. Amos in chapter 8, verses 11 and 12 says, Behold, the days are coming, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine on the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. They shall wander from sea to sea, from north to east. They shall run to and fro, seeking the word of the Lord, but shall not find it. God says, I am going to stop communicating with you. I am not going to reveal myself to the priests or the prophets. You're going to get spiritual. You're going to get religious, like we Californians do every time we have a disaster, every time an earthquake hits or something happens that causes people to be uncomfortable, churches are packed with people. And then when everything settles down again, they stop going. He's saying, well, look it. You're going to run and become religious, but I'm going to withhold information. And not only is that going to take place, verse 27, the king will mourn. The prince will be clothed with desolation. The hands of the common people will tremble. I will do to them according to their way and according to what they deserve. I will judge them. And then they shall know I am the Lord. You will reap what you have sown from king to commoner. And as a result, you're going to know that I am God because I have kept my word to you. I don't think there are very many things that are more painful in the heart of God, and I'll close with this. I don't know if there's anything more painful to the Lord as I study Scripture 
than to have those who call upon him and call him Father, call him their Lord and Savior, who, who go to church and, and show up and do all kinds of things, whose mouths profess a love for Christ, but whose lives are never changed. I never changed. Who, 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 will, who will show up in church and have opinions about things spiritual, but never sincerely yield themselves to God. And those are the ones that I get most concerned for. I do fear for them because I have come to a conclusion that here in this United States, a nation that we love so very much, there are multitudes and multitudes of people who profess to know the Lord, but in their behavior and their deeds deny Him. There's no transformations. You know, they don't read the Word of God unless somebody reads it to them. They don't pray unless they need something. They really don't like to hang around with Christians because they're uncomfortable with them. And when given the opportunity to sh share something about God and His goodness, they'd never take that opportunity because it really doesn't matter to them because they don't want to push their opinions on somebody else. And we have a nation filled with people like that who upon being asked in a survey, what is your religious faith, will say, I'm a Christian. But in reality, their hearts are far from God. This nation was a nation that was going to go through some judgment, heavy judgment, to the point that they were going to be like doves mourning the sound of a dove when it, when it makes its whatever its cry. It sounds like a moan. And he's saying, you're going to be like a dove mourning. You're going to be moaning in your pain. You're going to be wondering what happened. You're going to go to your priest and your prophet. You're going to say, what is the word from the Lord? But I've already told you that I'm not going to give to you a word. All I can bring to you is judgment. And that's what you're going to receive. And it's because you don't love me. It's because you love your idols. And God is a jealous God who will not allow worship to go to someone else when it belongs to him. And the nation was judged. And we'll see this more clearly next time in chapter 8.